You're listening to a sermon podcast from Redemption Hill Church, recorded at one of our worship services. Our scripture passage for today is Acts chapter 18, verses 1 to 17. I'll just give you a few seconds to flip or scroll to the passage. After this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. And he found a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to leave Rome. And he went to see them. And because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them and worked, for they were tent makers by trade. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and tried to persuade Jews and Greeks. When Silas and Timothy arrived from Macedonia, Paul was occupied with the word, testifying to the Jews that the Christ was Jesus. And when they opposed and reviled him, he shook out his garments and said to them, Your blood be on your own heads. I am innocent. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. And he left there and went to the house of a man named Titius Justus, a worshiper of God. His house was next door to the synagogue. Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed in the Lord together with his entire household. And many of the Corinthians, hearing Paul, believed and were baptized. And the Lord said to Paul one night in a vision, Do not be afraid, but go on speaking and do not be silent. For I am with you, And no one will attack you to harm you, for I have many in this city who are my people. And he stayed a year and six months, teaching the word of God among them. But when Gallio was proconsul of Achaia, the Jews made a united attack on Paul and brought him before the tribunal, saying, This man is persuading people to worship God contrary to the law. But when Paul was about to open his mouth, Gallio said to the Jews, If it were a matter of wrongdoing or vicious crime, O Jews, I would have reason to accept your complaint. But since it is a matter of questions about words and names and your own law, see to it yourselves. I refuse to be a judge of these things. And he drove them from the tribunal. And they all seized Sosthenes, the ruler of the synagogue, and beat him in front of the tribunal. But Gallio paid no attention to any of this. These are the true words of the living God. Thanks be to God. Help us to respond in faith. Thank you, Heather. Good afternoon, everyone. Sorry about that, Heather. I was so excited to get up here that I didn't read the service details properly. It's great to be here. I actually was at ECP this morning uh, visiting English Church Plant for the first time, and so it was very wonderful to be there, and now it's wonderful to be back, even if I did try and climb up on the stage a little bit too soon. So this morning, uh, our sermon title is Living in Weakness and Trembling. Let me start by telling you a story. Uh, A woman by the name of Joni Erickson Tata, in 1967, she was 17 years of age, She was very active. She loved sports and all kinds of outdoor activities. Her father had been an Olympian. So clearly athletics and being physical and strong was a huge part of the family. And there are indications that her dad wanted her to grow up to do something similar. But when she was 17, and and they were a Christian family, when she was 17, she dived headfirst into a pool and it was shallower than she thought and she broke her neck. And that was in 1967, friends. That's a long time ago. She's been a quadriplegic since then. That's a long, long time. And Joni Erickson Tata spent her first couple of years after her accident angry, bitter with God, grumbling, and thinking that her life had come to nothing. But she began to see something of God's kindness and grace and wisdom to her, And her life began to turn around. She began to serve God. She began to ask God how he could use her in the midst of her weakness. And she has lived the most remarkable life. She has written uh, 40 books. She paints with 
paintbrushes in her mouth. She has founded numerous Christian organizations for people with disabilities and has lived this most stunning and amazing life. And God has done this not only despite her weakness, but he's done this through her weakness. Today we're going to see how God loves to stand with weak people to advance his kingdom. And the context of our passage today is that Paul is planting churches. He's going to the leading cities, uh, Ephesus, one of the religious centers, Athens last week we heard, which is one of the kind of intellectual centers. Today he's at Corinth, uh, a big commercial center. And Paul is going there, establishing churches, preaching the gospel, seeing churches established. Paul's doing this because he's obeying Jesus' command to go into all the nations, make disciples of all nations, and teach them to obey everything I've said, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Spirit. And that command of Jesus implies churches will be started, where people will be baptized. Now, what Paul doesn't know, but what we know, is that this strategy of preaching the gospel so that churches get planted is not just faithful to Jesus, but it's one of the best ways, statistically, of reaching a city and of new people coming to faith when new congregations get established. And that's why we are planting churches and we hope to do more of this in the future. Now, as Paul does this, Paul discovers that this mission to plant churches and to preach the gospel is something that the enemy doesn't want him to do. And there is a cosmic battle involved. And I think Paul understands the significance of his task because in uh, verse 6, I think it is, or verse, sorry, let me find it, verse 6, when some of the Jews reject Paul, Paul says to them, your blood be on your own heads. I am innocent of your blood. And Paul is referring to Ezekiel where a watchman is called by God to watch out for danger and to warn the people of impending disaster. And if a watchman does his task and warns people of the danger to come and they don't listen, the watchman is innocent. But if the watchman does not, if the watchman sees danger but does not tell people of the danger to come, then he will be held responsible for their blood. And Paul says, here I am in Corinth. I'm preaching the gospel to you Jews. Many of you are rejecting me. I'm innocent of your blood. If you reject the good news of the gospel, you're going to have to stand and face God himself. Paul realizes the, what, what a significant task this is that he has. And what's interesting, though, in the passage is that given the high stakes, therefore, of church planting and the battle involved, we, sh- well, we should not be surprised that there's much adversity that comes to Paul. But what is surprising is, that, is how God works in this passage. God chooses not to overcome these adversities with a massive display of power, but rather to work through Paul's weaknesses. And we're going to see why later, because that displays the gospel in a beautiful way. Now, this applies to church planting. It applies to ministry and discipleship and starting a CG. It applies to life, that God often works through our weaknesses. It applies to to dating and marriage and parenting and work. So I want to ask you this morning, before we dive in, where are you weak? Where do you feel inadequate? Where do you feel like a bit of an imposter? Where do you feel like you have natural limitations or physical infirmities that hinder you and limit you from doing the life that you think will most glorify God? We're going to see today how this plays out for Paul and us in three parts. Firstly, we're going to see Paul's experience of weakness. Secondly, God's grace to Paul in his weakness. And finally, Paul's witness in his weakness. So if we go back to our passage in verse 10, verse 9 and 10, let's put up that slide. It tells us that the Lord had to come to Paul and meet him at some point when he was at Corinth. The Lord said to Paul one night in a vision, do not be afraid. But go on speaking and do not be silent, for I am with you. No one will attack you to harm you, for I have many in the city who are my people. Now, friends, if you read this, this implies that Paul was afraid, afraid of speaking, afraid of being beaten and attacked. And God has to come and stand with him and to assure him. Now, when we first read uh, when, you know, when we had Heather read to us um, this passage, maybe it didn't strike you as to why this was necessary. I mean, why does Paul feel this way? But we know that Paul really was terrified when he went to Corinth. And we know that because 1 Corinthians chapter 2, 
is a letter that Paul writes to the church at Corinth later on, and he tells them in chapter 2 how, how he felt when he arrived, and this is what he says. And I, when I came to you, brothers, I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. Friends, Paul was a nervous wreck in Corinth. And why is this? Well, firstly, he's been chased. He's been beaten, stoned, and imprisoned. And when he moved to another town, the Jews often chased him and followed him there to cause trouble for him. Friends, I don't think that it's unreasonable to say that Paul arrived in Corinth as a psychological wreck. Maybe some of you this morning feel fragile, feel an overwhelming sense of your own weakness and trembling. This is, Paul is telling us, this is what he was like. In addition to this, it's not just the fact that he's been hounded, but Paul probably felt a sense of being intimidated by this massive city, Corinth. It was an intimidating city. These people were intellectually smart and arrogant. They were proud of their city. They'd been rebuilt by Julius Caesar in 46 BC. They had the games there, the Ishtman Games, every year. And they had political prestige as the capital of Achaia. Paul has to counter their pride when he writes to them in chapter 1 of 1 Corinthians. But not only were they kind of impressive in that sense from a worldly point of view, but they were deeply immoral. Corinth had the temple of Aphrodite, temple of Venus there, and she was the goddess of love. And there were, in this temple, had 1,000 female sex slaves that served this temple. And they roamed the streets at night as prostitutes. So to be a Corinthian throughout the empire, everyone knew you're that kind of a person. Maybe you're here this morning and you're a parent or a prospective parent. Maybe you're wondering about the kind of world that your kids are going to grow up in. Maybe you're wondering how are you going to navigate this culture that we're living in. Friends, Paul is ministering in this kind of a culture. And circumstantially, Paul's without support, financial support. He finds himself opposed and reviled by the Jews in verse 6. Then he finds himself under attack. It tells us later on in verse 12 to 13, standing before the proconsul. And all these reasons, this is why Paul says, I came to you in weakness and in fear. So for those of us this morning who felt like we had to park our weakness at the door or at the lift before we come into church, this passage is telling us, no, 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 this passage is here to speak to you. And even the mighty, mighty, trembling Apostle Paul understands. Now some of us may wonder, if this is what Paul, if this is how Paul was, you know, why doesn't God give greater victory to Paul? I mean, this guy's like, you know, busting his gut, trying to serve Jesus, and Jesus risen from the dead, he is victorious. I mean, why doesn't he just make it a smoother path for Paul? Well, why doesn't God just obliterate all of Paul's enemies? Well, we're going to explore what God does. Let's see God's grace to Paul in his weakness. What's fascinating when you look at the passage is that God does not respond by simply removing all of Paul's adversities. Paul's adversities remain. They continue in many ways through the chapter. And yet, in the midst of them, we see God's grace poured out upon Paul. And God comes to stand with Paul, saying, I am with you. Don't be afraid. Yes, all these enemies, these roaring lions seem to be staring you down and roaring at you. But Paul, you can continue going on because I, God, I, your father, I am with you. And so in verse 9 to 10, we saw the Lord said to Paul, don't be afraid, go on speaking, for I, I am with you. This is God's promise. This is God's grace to him. Now, we're going to see how God's grace to Paul is manifest in at least two ways. That's kind of how I've summarized it in the passage. Firstly, God's grace comes through the provision of people and resources. God clearly encourages Paul through friends here. There are new friends that Paul has, Priscilla and Aquila, uh, meet Paul. Uh, at Corinth, it seems like, in verse, uh, it, it tells us in verse 2 to 3. And interestingly enough, Priscilla and Aquila were, they seem to be like expats. They were moving around. And they actually move around a lot throughout the empire. And they become significant ministry partners of Paul. And it tells us in verse 2 that they left Rome because there was an edict given where all the Jews were expelled out of Rome. So 
Priscilla and Aquila have bad life circumstances. They have to go to Corinth, but they meet Paul. They're both tent makers where Paul's working his day job, and they become friends, and they are going to be like, 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 like life support to Paul. And we'll see more next Sunday as we see more about Priscilla and Aquila, this business couple. And they have a huge impact on Paul. Maybe you're here today. Maybe you've moved to Singapore from somewhere else. Maybe you're only here for a short period of time. You can be a profound blessing to the kingdom of God and to God's people, even in a short space of time. But we also see that Paul has old friends that come and visit him. Silas and Timothy, verse 5. When Silas and Timothy arrived from Macedonia, Paul was occupied with the word. Now, this word occupied uh, means on one level that Silas and Timothy brought financial support. They brought money from the, the churches in Macedonia, I think. And then Paul was able to leave his day job and just to devote himself to uh, working full time in his ministry. But the word occupied actually has like a double meaning to it. There's a sense in the word occupied that Paul is preaching with vigor and enthusiasm. It's like a kind of life comes into Paul. I think it's elsewhere in Corinthians where Paul talks about Titus and how he didn't want to even enter an open door for ministry unless Titus, his buddy, was with him. These friends, friends, these ordinary relationships are like a grace to Paul in the midst of his adversity. And God grants Paul spiritual fruit in the midst of his adversity too. We spoke about how Paul says you know, to, the, to the Jews, uh, I'm innocent of your blood. But then surprisingly, when Paul leaves the synagogue in verse 6, uh, Paul says he goes and min he ministers um, at the house of a man named Titius Justus, and then in verse whose house was next door to the synagogue, and then Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed in the Lord and was baptized. So it's like suddenly there's a little bit of fruit. God shows Paul, hey, I'm still at work here. And in fact, many people think that what God meant when he said, I have many people in the city, is not God just saying there's m multiple churches in Corinth and all these hidden Christians that are going to pop out the woodwork because Paul's one of the first Christians there and he's like breaking new ground. There weren't many churches there. There actually weren't any churches there. But what that line is likely referring to is the fact that God has many people in that city that he's working in and calling to himself. And though Paul is in the middle of adversity, as he preaches, God's going to use Paul's preaching to gather in those that are God's people into the church. And Crispus is one of those. And Paul begins to see some of the spiritual fruit. Friends, can you see here, in the midst of, of Paul's weakness, in the midst of his adversity, God, God's grace comes to, to fortify and strengthen him. Not by removing the weakness, but by showing him he's standing with him. And we also see that God's Grace comes through turning adversity to triumph. Now, we'll see in a moment, but there are some parallels in Luke's, uh, sorry, in Acts, and in this passage in particular with Jesus. So remember, Luke wrote the Gospel of Luke, and then he wrote Acts. And in Luke, one of the things that we see in Jesus is that about a third of the way through Luke, uh, a third of the way through the Gospel of Luke, it says Jesus then set his face toward Jerusalem. And Jesus knows he's going to die. And he's marching toward there to suffer and die. And he keeps telling his disciples, this is what's going to happen to me. And in Acts, we begin to see Paul moving and heading toward Jerusalem. And people beginning to warn him and say to Paul, you're going to suffer. The person who owns this belt, there's going to be adversity and suffering. And Paul says, I'm compelled by the Spirit to go to Jerusalem. I know that suffering and affliction wake me there, but I must fulfill the task that God has given me. There's a kind of parallel here. And now, just as with Jesus, who was arrested by the Jews, put on trial by the Roman overlords, and then uh, had the initial Roman ruler say, this is not really our business, so that happens with Paul. Arrested by the Jews, Paul is going to be put before the Roman rulers, the Roman proconsul, who's going to dismiss the charges. And Jesus, who suffered in weakness and whose weakness was turned to strength, where God turned Jesus' death and his crucifixion toward our strength, a similar thing is going to happen to Paul here. What happens? Paul gets arrested. He gets put before the proconsul. And the proconsul goes and listens to the Jews who, are, who have brought Paul and they hear all of their complaints against Paul. He's causing people to worship other gods. That's Jesus. And the proconsul says something to him. He says, he says, 
If it were a matter of wrongdoing of a vicious crime, O Jews, I'd have reason to accept your complaint. But since it's a matter of questions about words and names of your own law, see to it yourselves. I refuse, I refuse to be a judge of these things. What happens? Galileo dismisses their complaint. And this may seem somewhat inconsequential, but it's very significant. Because the fact that in a major Roman city, Corinth, uh, a proconsul ruled that Paul's preaching was not disturbing the public order and was legal, and that essentially Christianity was some variation of Judaism, what this essentially did was it set a legal precedent throughout the empire that Paul's preaching and Christians could no longer be persecuted as being a false sect, but rather Christianity was seen as being under the broad umbrella of Judaism, and therefore they had legal covering. And this really provides Paul and others breathing room for the next couple of years. In other words, what seemed to be real adversity here, God turns around actually for Paul and for Christians' goods. Friends, I want us to see here that God is not removing Paul's suffering, but he's with Paul in the midst of it. And the result is here that Paul has a long and fruitful ministry in Corinth. Verse 11 tells us he stayed a year and six months teaching the word of God among them. This is one of his longest and most fruitful times. And yet, he's trembling. He's in fear. His position seems to be precarious. I mean, even when Galileo makes this ruling, it says he drove them from the tribunal, verse 17, and they all seized Sosthenes, the ruler of the synagogue, and beat him in front of the tribunal, but Galileo paid no attention to this. So Galileo is saying, hey, you know, let Paul go. I'm not going to accept these charges. And yet the ruler of the synagogue, who maybe uh, we don't know exactly why he was beaten, but these Jews beat him and Galileo just leaves it. I mean, Paul's probably thinking, oh my gosh, like, I'm probably not getting much protection here, right? But yet, do not be afraid, Paul. Go on speaking. No one will harm you. I have many men in the city. My friends, some of us, I understand, some of, some of us this morning may be saying, well, if that's the grace of God, count me out. <laughs> that's not the kind of grace I want, right? And if you thought that way, you're not a heretic, because Paul tells us he thought a similar way. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul says there's this thorn in the side, a messenger from Satan, this affliction the suffering that Paul goes through. And it says he pleads with the Lord to remove it. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. God, please, take this away. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. Friends, to put it another way, we could say this. It's not that God doesn't care for Paul, but that God loves Paul so much he wants Paul to experience a deeper power than what Paul could know through his strengths. This is a lesson that I am very slowly trying to learn. I have not been, I have not wanted people to see and think of me as a weak person in my life. I've been for counseling in the past, they're like, you can't admit any weaknesses. That's not in line with this passage. That, that's not in line with the gospel. But you know the blessing when you do start to recognize your limitations and confess your weaknesses? You know what that does for a marriage when you can begin to be more real and not pretend you've got it all together? And not just show like a, a stiff upper lip and pretend like nothing in this world affects you and you're just bulletproof? but could be more vulnerable in your relationships. Oh, friends. Yes, for those who are strong, this is scary, but this is, this, is, this is beautiful. This is how God breathes His grace and His life into relationships. This is how God makes marriages strong. And this is what the shape of Christianity is. Weakness, then glory. Suffering, then glory, death, and then life. And we're going to see this now in our, our last point, Paul's witness in his weakness. 
So far, we've seen Paul's circumstances, why he was weak and trembling. We've seen how God interacts with him. doesn't remove all these adversities, but yet God is standing with him in the midst of them. What does Paul do? How does Paul live? We see here, friends, Paul's priority, verse 5 tells us, is to preach. And the nature of what he says is the key to understanding this dynamic of God. Now, I want you to pay attention to verse 5. It's, it, you're going to read it and think that it's irrelevant, but listen to me carefully. Verse 5. When Silas and Timothy arrived from Macedonia, Paul was occupied with the word, he's preaching, testifying to the Jews that the Christ was Jesus. Now, some of you are rolling your eyes saying, is that the big reveal? I mean, don't we hear the gospel every time here? Let, no, pay attention, pay attention. This is written in a, in a very specific way. He's testifying to the Jews that the Christ was Jesus. Now, first things first, some of us think you know, of Jesus Christ, and we think Christ was Jesus' family name, like my family name's Murphy, right? Mary and Joseph was Joseph Christ and Mary Christ and Jesus, Jesus Christ. <laughs> but that, that is not the case. Christ is a title. It's a title. And the title is the anointed one, the Messiah, the long-awaited one, the one that the Old Testament uh, scriptures have promised and prophesied, who will rule, who will rule over all of this creation, the one to whom every knee will bow, the one who will deliver God's people from all of their oppressors, will lead them into new life, where a new kingdom will come. And they were longing for this, and they couldn't wait for this Messiah to come. A display of strength and power. He will come and liberate us from our Roman overlords. And Paul is telling these Jews who know exactly what to expect as far as they are concerned. Paul says, the Christ, this ruler, was Jesus. What is Paul saying? Paul's saying, this figure that you've longed for and prayed for and desired, who will come and deliver you, that Christ is the peasant? From Nazareth, who died on a Roman cross, who suffered? Friends, this is a crazy message. Those words are incomprehensible to a Jew. The Christ was Jesus who died on a cross? This is, like, this is a complete paradox. It's an oxymoron. It's like saying, come, I'm going to make you very, very rich. Come while I give you all of my monopoly money. You're like, That's not gonna, huh. you've misunderstood. That's not going to make me rich. It's worth nothing. The Christ was Jesus? This doesn't strike you as true power. It seems weak. It seems pathetic. That's why Paul says the preaching of the gospel, the preaching of Christ was, was, was weakness, foolishness to many. And friends, Jesus really suffered this way. Mark, I was doing some preparation recently for Easter weekend, thinking about Jesus' death and his resurrection. In Mark 14, verse 33, it tells us when Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane, he was in agony as he's praying. And it says there in verse 33 that Jesus was astonished. He was shocked when he began to comprehend the, the weight of the suffering that was before him. Sweating like drops of blood. It shocked. Oh, horrified. Friends, Jesus has been through something no one here has ever been through. Paul's witness here, friends, is that the Christ, our Savior, was Jesus, a sufferer, crucified in weakness. Now, friends, we know that Jesus' resurrection three days later is the ultimate vindication, the eternal victory, so that Jesus will stand with us forever having defeated death and sin. Jesus' resurrection, friends, is true, is true, true victory. But we must admit that it is unusual. There is real loss and grief and sadness. Now, why does God work this way? We don't know all the answers. I don't want to pretend I can unravel the mysteries of God for all of you this morning. But there are two things that we, we can, I can say. Firstly, Jesus' friends must enter into our world not just in a weak way, but in an even worse way. He will ultimately become sin for us so that he can die for our sins 
and forgive us of them. Jesus entering this world because he's come to accomplish something. Not just to be the hero and to have everyone worship him, but he's come to do something. He's come to carry not just our weaknesses and frailties and infirmities, which he does carry. He's come to carry our sins. And Jesus enters into suffering in this world by being beaten. He experiences suffering. Jesus experiences sin, though, in a different way. Not by Jesus performing sin or living in sin, but by having our sins laid upon him at the cross. This is fundamental to Jesus' ministry and his work to come and save us from our sins. But secondly, friends, I think Jesus or God working this way is because Jesus is turning what this world values on its head. God is showing us his kingdom is another kind of kingdom. A kingdom that is not just for the strong, where weakness is scoffed and despised and we leave it at the lift lobby as we come up into the ballroom. No, Paul here in this passage, but because of Jesus, I, Jesus identifies with weak sufferers. And so Jesus triumphs over sin and suffering, but in a subversive way. Not by dismissing it or saying that's irrelevant or that's just for like people who can't pull their lives together. No, Jesus has the victory not in a way that isolates the weak, not in a way that, that, that kind of mocks weak people, but in a way that gathers them in, saying, I've come for you. I've come, I understand you in your ways. Because this is what his kingdom is like and about. Not just a kingdom for the strong and the brave, but the weak and the broken who need a savior. To put it another way, we could say God's power and God's glory the glory of God is seen not in God disdaining weakness, but in choosing to enter into it and to love and to serve those stuck in the midst of it. Friends, this is why the gospel is so wonderful. Jesus doesn't just come and say, look, you've all made a mess of your lives, but as soon as I'm done with you, then we'll all be strong and we'll all be like, okay. Yeah, he comes to heal us and, and repair us. But he comes to meet us and stand with us in the midst of our lives. So let's explore as we wrap up to, to or what Christ crucified and weakness means for our lives in two ways. Friends, Christ crucified and weakness gives value to our suffering. Clarifying what suffering is not. Suffering and adversity and weakness is not punishment from God for your sins. God doesn't look and say, look, all the good boys here, you're going to get rich, marry someone beautiful, and you won't get sick. But if you've been bad and sinned a lot, it's like, man, you, you, you've got bad years ahead of you. That's not how the Bible works. There are other religions that teach that kind of thing. That's not the good news of Christianity. Jesus says, in this world, you, you, you will have trouble. You're good, you're bad. Didn't Ecclesiastes teach us that? You do all the right things, you're righteous, things will go wrong. Now, let's, let me just qualify that. Some of us do suffer because we're stupid and we've sinned. I certainly have suffered through my own sin and my stupidity before. So sometimes there's a correlation. You do something really dumb, and then you're like, oh my gosh, I'm going to have to pay for this for a while. Sure. I can tell you my stories about that, right? But generally, you don't tie every bit of adversity or suffering or weakness to your own personal sin. Jesus Christ, the most righteous person, suffered, died. Paul here, serving Jesus. It's not punishment for our sins. It's the shape of the kingdom, suffering, then glory. And Paul knows in this passage now, he knows God is standing with him. And he can therefore say when he writes to the, to the Colossians, I am sharing in Christ's afflictions. Or at the end of 2 Corinthians, when I am weak, then I am strong. And this strength that Paul experiences now is a strength because he knows not just his own brilliance and gifts, but he knows the presence of the risen Christ with him in his suffering. 
Paul has come to enjoy the presence and the nearness of God more than even his physical comfort. And therefore, he says he can rejoice in his weaknesses. We, through it, get to know him and his power more. And therefore, our faith, friends, we, as, as Christians, we, we come to prize God and knowing him and his fellowship and his standing with us more than just a, a comfortable life. But it also shows us, secondly, that the gospel goes forward through our weaknesses more often than our strengths. Friends, Christianity is not about being a superstar with all the gifts. You know, when I was a kid, I used to think, why doesn't God just convert all of the celebrities? And I was in like sports mad South Africa. It's like, why don't you just convert the captain of the cricket team and the rugby team, and then the whole country will, will become Christian? I mean, it's like so simple, right? You just get like a couple of celebs. It's like, God, I've got a better strategy than you. But friends, that's not how God works. God does not just try and pick all the superstars, get his like all-star team together, and like, now we're, now we're really going to like, man, we're really going to rock this now. Jesus' glory and God's glory is displayed through the witness of a message that is foolishness to the world, the Christ suffered and died for you, and through broken, weak Christians. It's actually often about letting our weakness come to the table and letting God use that. Show how we love him and trust him and how his grace is seen in our weakness. Paul says, I was with you in much weakness and fear and trembling. My speech and my message were not with not in plausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and power that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. He wants the power of God to be seen as he is unable in his own natural gifts to impress everyone, but yet there's a power from God. And I think the context here probably means actual spiritual gifts as 1 Corinthians 12 and 14 spell out, healing and prophecy and tongues and other things where it's like, wow, God's clearly at work among you. But also the, the, the power of God in fortifying Paul and his courage and his strength and his, his confession of Christ in the midst of his own weaknesses. Friends, there is true glory in the cross and in God's kingdom but in a way that doesn't lead us to make much of ourselves, but to truly see our Savior and to make much of Him. Now, Paul did have some strengths, and God did use those. Paul, Pharisee of Pharisees, he's clearly intellectually brilliant. Uh, he's absolutely brilliant in many ways, and God did use many of those, those gifts. So God doesn't say, look, all your strengths, just throw those away and don't use those. No, God uses our personalities, and He puts gifts in us. And, but we don't rely on those things and say, the key to the kingdom is like my whatever gift that I have. No. The key to the kingdom is the message of a weak or of a crucified Savior coming through broken people who will love and trust our God. Friends, if you impress people with your strengths, yeah, they may leave impressed with you. But when you love God and you persevere and suffer and trust Jesus in your weakness, God is truly glorified. And as Ray Ortland told us, when he was here last year, August. You can either be impressive or you can be known. But you can't be impressive and known because deep inside every one of us, there are all real weaknesses. And many times we only appear impressive when we are masquerading, hiding our weaknesses, put forward in our strengths. Can we be a church that sees and recognizes, man, we are weak. We're struggling with mental struggles, and physical infirmities, and fear, and trembling, psychological instability at times. And yet we don't hide those things as though they're an embarrassment to Jesus. But we come to our suffering Savior. He says, this is why I need a Savior. Thank you, Jesus, for opening wide your arms to me. How can we do this as a church, friends? I want to encourage us as a church not to hide our weaknesses from one another. Don't hide it from God. Don't, don't like read off your CV to God in your prayer times. God sees it all. And don't do that with one another. Let's open our hearts and our lives to one another in a real way. And then let's expect the living God to do what only He can do in our lives.
Friends, ultimately, the gospel is better news than what we could even make up for ourselves. We often want all our circumstances just to be aligned and things to go very comfortably. The gospel comes to show us a king who saved us, uh, saves deeper problems than we realize we have, our sins, through suffering so that we might know him and have him stand with us in the midst of our sufferings and ultimately to bring that kingdom, that otherworldly kingdom to bear in the kingdom of this world. Friends, Jesus is standing with us. And this is because the Christ, our Savior, is Jesus, the sufferer. Let's turn to him and pray now. Father, if we were to invent the best God that we could invent, it would pale in comparison with the glories of who you are. We may think we would make you amazing, but we would head off in the wrong direction. Lord God, you are so much more beautiful so much more glorious and beautiful and tender than we could imagine. And not only are you like that, but you've come to reveal yourself to us and to love us and to fold us into relationship with you and to build a community of people who are learning slowly, stumbling forward, but learning to live like you and be like you. Lord, this morning... We want to confess to you not only our, we, our sins, we want to confess our reliance upon our strengths. And then we want to receive with open arms our Lord and Savior, Jesus, our Savior, who was a sufferer. We ask this in his name. Amen. You've been listening to a sermon podcast from Redemption Hill Church. You can find more of our sermons online at www.rhc.org.sg.